So let's now discuss a few of the popular reverse genetics approaches that you might see. And so the idea of reverse genetics really is that instead of kind of randomly introducing mutations across the genome and then trying to identify individuals with the phenotype of interest and sequencing them to figure out what the mutation was, in reverse genetics, <coughs> you really have kind of a more targeted approach where you, uh, you have a tool like CRISPR-Cas9 or uh, siRNA to, uh, which you can use to uh, knock out or knock down specific you know, individual genes or small collections of genes and therefore perturb those genes. And then you can go and figure out after the fact, um, you know, what, what was the effect of knocking out that gene? And so, uh, again, kind of unlike forward genetics, this is a much more targeted approach in the sense that you kind of have to have, you know, you have to have a, uh, a particular gene in mind, uh, in order to apply your, your particular approach here. Um, so it used to be true that reverse genetics was more limited in throughput in the sense that um, it wasn't very easy to, for example, knock down every gene in the genome. Uh, but nowadays, uh, you know, more and more people have, are designing uh, ways to do like genome-wide screens with like CRISPR-Cas9, for example. And so um, a lot of the benefits of forward genetics uh, are starting to be uh, are starting to also be captured by reverse genetic approaches. And so the main reverse, genetics appro reverse genetic approaches we'll talk about in this lecture are basically uh, anti-sense RNA uh, as well as CRISPR-Cas9. CRISPR so when it comes to anti-sense based technologies, you really have <clears throat> two main options. The first one is called small interfering RNA or siRNA for short. And so the idea with the siRNA approach is that um, you're really using an endogenous uh, RNA interference pathway uh, in order to uh, identify and cleave target mRNA. So what you do is you first synthesize a double-stranded piece of RNA, which is, we'll call here an immature siRNA. And when you introduce uh, a double-stranded siRNA uh, into the cell, basically a complex called dicer comes along and binds to the double-stranded siRNA and cleaves it into a shorter 20 to 25 base pair, uh, more mature siRNA fragment. Uh, and so uh, this 20 to 25 base pair siRNA uh, fragment has what's called a seed sequence, uh, where the seed sequence is really what's complementary to your target mRNA. Um, and so after the siRNA is cleaved into a 20 to 25 base pair uh, single-stranded fragment, the risk complex comes along uh, and binds to the single-stranded uh, siRNA, loads onto it, uh, and then basically uses it to guide itself to uh, a target mRNA, where after binding, uh, it then cleaves the target mRNA to basically destroy the mRNA product. So the other antisense-based technology is called the antisense Gatmer oligonucleotides. Uh, and we'll call it ASO for short. And so the idea with this particular technology is that you're synthesizing what's in this case a single-stranded uh, oligonucleotide. Uh, and these single-stranded ASOs basically have a modified backbone and flanking residues, uh, which basically increase the stability uh, of these uh, oligonucleotides. So they basically help prevent uh, degradation, but they also increase the uh, they increase the binding of these oligonucleotides to the target mRNA. And so the idea is that these single-stranded uh, oligonucleotides uh, can directly then uh, form like a DNA-RNA-like complex uh, with the target mRNA. And so when that happens, uh, basically RNA-SH, which is an enzyme which is pretty prevalent across uh, most eukaryotes, um, basically recognizes these hybrid DNA RNA like complexes, and then just cleaves the uh, cleaves both the mRNA as well as the ASO. So one of the primary considerations of designing antisense oligos is the question of um, what should you make your target sequence look like, right? And so uh, designing antisense oligos for genes that have, for example, no alternative splicing 
is pretty easy because at least in theory, uh, you could design a oligo that's complementary to almost any exon uh, for that kind of gene. Uh, unfortunately, for most higher organisms, uh, you have a lot of alternative splicing, and so uh, you can run ac easily run across situations like what I'm showing you here, where this hypothetical gene with three exons might have multiple isoforms. In this case, uh, a gene may or may not include the second exon. And you oftentimes have to, for example, decide how to target only one of those isoforms. And so, you know, a typical question is in this kind of case, how do I target isoform B, right? Um, and some related questions that you want to think about are, for example, um, in general, uh, if you have a gene with, say, like 150 exons, um, how many potential isoforms could you uh, could be produced from that gene? And so we'll talk a little bit more about this in kind of the transcriptal mix lecture. But uh, in theory, like, you know, it's, it's useful to think about, you know, how many potential isoforms might there be, and therefore that would, in some sense, impact your decision about how you how you design uh, sRNAs, for example, to target specific isoforms. Um, another important question is, uh, you know, is it ever possible if you have, for example, families of genes with uh, that are homologous uh, and therefore might have pretty high sequence similarity? Is it is it ever really possible to target, say, one one out of like even a gene family of two uh, of two proteins um, if they are recent duplicate? if they're recent duplicates. So here I want to quickly show you how to design transcript-specific sRNA. And so suppose we have a hypothetical gene that has three exons, exon A, B, and C. And suppose that gene produces two transcripts, where transcript one splices out exon B, and in transcript two, you retain all three exons. And so if you want to design an sRNA that targets specifically transcript one, but avoids transcript two, then one way that you could do this is you could design an sRNA that targets the junction between exon A and exon C. Because since transcript 2 has exon A and exon C separated by exon B, then any sRNA that spans the junction of exon AC is going to be specific to transcript 1. And so similarly for transcript 2, you have a few more options in the sense that because exon B is only included in transcript 2, then basically any siRNA that contains a significant amount of sequence overlapping exon B is going to be more specific to transcript 2 than compared to transcript 1. And so beyond uh, alternative splicing, both RNAi and uh, your uh, Gapmer uh, technologies have multiple considerations that you have to think about uh, when you're going to use these technologies. Um, Decision number one comes down to, well, you know, which which is better, uh, siRNA uh, or your ASOs? And so I think uh, the general consensus is that if you are knocking down genes in vitro, then siRNA tends to be more effective. Um, and this is just because it, it tends to be easier to generate siRNA because um, you're just synthesizing double-stranded RNA. Um, unlike the ASOs, which, you know, you need to incorporate a modified backbone, um, as well as you need to chemically modify the five prime and three prime flanking ends. Uh, in vivo, I think it's a little bit less clear which technology is better. Um, siRNA and uh, ASOs by, by virtue of being single-stranded or double-stranded um, have different absorption properties. And so uh, certain um, technologies like sRNA might be more efficient uh, to deliver into certain tissues, whereas ASOs might be more efficient to deliver into other tissues. And so uh, the jury's out in terms of what is more effective in vivo. Um, both of them, you know, that said, I mean, both can be used to knock down genes. Uh, there's different ways, again, there's different ways of delivering them into, into cells, particularly in vivo, but um, in general, both could be used. Um, the nice thing about sRNA is that you're you're really uh, using an endogenous pathway in order to do the targeting. Uh, you're using the RNA interference pathway via uh, Dicer uh, and the risk complex. Um, and I think the, one of the problems with ASOs is that 
because they, uh, even though they're modified, they do tend to get degraded uh, a little more quickly compared to siRNA. And so you need to use higher concentrations in order to uh, effectively knock down genes. Um, a consideration you have for both RNAi and ASOs are that uh, you tend to have uh, off-target effects, right? And so I previously mentioned that siRNA need these seed sequences uh, that are complementary to your target mRNA. Um, one of the problems with antisense-based technologies, and we'll see the same thing goes for CRISPR-Cas9, is that um, oftentimes you don't need perfect complementarity. So if your seed sequence is like 10 to 12 base pairs, um, sometimes you may only need like, say, eight, pa eight base pairs or seven base pairs uh, complementarity out of those 10 to 12 base pairs in order for binding to happen. And so oftentimes you get a lot of off-target effects. Um, so some other problems you might have are that um, just like with just like as we discussed with the forward screens, um, gene redundancy can be a big big problem. So if you target uh, you know one isoform of one gene and it turns out that there's uh, gene functional redundancy with another either another isoform or another duplicated gene, then you might not observe any phenotype. Um, just like uh, before, you could it could be easy to miss subtle phenotypes. Um, more important, well, also importantly, um, because uh, reverse genetics technologies are based on you kind of pre-identifying some region of the genome or some gene that you want to target, uh, oftentimes the choice of which gene to start with is kind of guided by, uh, guided by literature or databases that we'll talk about later, where people have basically stored annotations about what genes perform what function or are known to perform what function. Um, and so if those databases, for example, have misannotations, and so if they have errors, then, you know, you're barking up the wrong tree, basically. Um, in order to get around the problems of things like gene redundancies or off-target effects, um, uh, or essentially lack of comp good complementarity to your own isoform, um, oftentimes in practice, uh, when you use sRNA to knock down genes, uh, you use multiple... Uh, you design multiple sRNAs. So you might design like three to five sRNA to target a single gene. Um, and so that, uh, you know, helps for the most part. Um, some additional considerations that, uh, you know, related to alternative splicing that you might have are that, you know, certain genes might have multiple promoters. So you might have to consider that you should target multiple promoters with your collection of sRNA. Um, some other more practical problems are that so I mentioned that when you design an sRNA to target an isoform, it's it's important to know what other isoforms are actually, uh, what other isoforms are being expressed so that you can try to target exactly your isoform and not hit other isoforms. Uh, it's not always trivial to identify which isoforms are actually being expressed in a cell at a given time. Uh, so in general, for example, if you have like 10 exons, um, if you ignore like uh, you know, if you ignore problems related to like alternative splicing or so on, you could you could theor um, or sorry, if you ignore problems related to like um, alternative promoters and so on, you could potentially have, for example, like two to the two to the ten minus one uh, possible isoforms if your gene has ten uh, ten exons. Um, in practice, many usually many fewer isoforms than that are actually being expressed. But it's even with the RNA sequencing technologies that we'll talk about in future lectures, um, it can be hard to identify exactly which isoforms are being expressed. And so in that sense, then if you don't know exactly which isoforms are being expressed in your cells, then it's hard to design sRNAs that target exactly the isoform that you care about because you don't know what else is being expressed from that locus.